<clears throat> Hello. Uh, we're back and it's time to read more Kugel. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Okay, I had to remember to check my mic settings because, once again, for some reason, Windows has decided to turn my mic down very low. Let's turn it back up. I think we should be okay now. Um, of course, my cat, who has been sitting next to me at my computer for an hour, has just now, once I get started, decided he wants to move. Oh, little guy. That's fine. You do you, bud. His name is Mr. Wizard. <laughs> Alright, I think the mic is in good shape now. Let me... One final adjustment, and that should do it. Alright. All right, I think this is good. Let's go. <laughs> All right, we're officially starting Chapter 3 of Kugel Saga, from Toastfold to Port Perdus. Chapter 1. The Columns. Hmm. Kugel marched along the foreshore, shivering to the bite of the wind. The landscape was barren and dreary. To the left, black waves broke over the mudflats. To the right, a line of low hills barred access to inland regions. Hugel's mood was bleak. He carried neither terces nor so much as a sharp stick to protect himself against footpads. Slime from the mudflats squelched in his boots, and his sodden garments smelled of marine decay. At a tidal pool, Kugel rinsed out his boots and thereafter walked more comfortably, though the slime still made a mockery of style and dignity. Hunching along the shore, Kugel resembled a great bedraggled bird. Where a sluggish river seeped into the sea, Kugel came upon an old road, which might well lead to the village Tustfold and the possibility of food and shelter. Kugel turned inland, away from the shore. To keep himself warm, Kugel began to trot and jog, with knees jerking high. So passed a mile or two, and the hills gave way to a curious landscape of cultivated fields mingled with areas of wasteland. In the distance, steep-sided knolls rose at irregular intervals, like islands in a sea of air. No human habitation could be seen, but in the fields, groups of women tended broad beans and millet. As Kugel jogged past, they raised from their work to stare. Kugel found their attention offensive and ran proudly past, looking neither right nor left. Clouds sliding over the hills from the west cooled the air and seemed to presage rain. Kugel searched ahead for the village Toostfold without success. The clouds drifted across the sun, darkening the already wan light, and the landscape took on the semblance of an ancient sepia painting with flat perspectives and the punko trees superimposed like scratchings of black ink. A shaft of sunlight struck through the clouds to play upon a cluster of white columns at a distance of something over a mile. Hugo stopped short to stare at the odd array. A temple, a mausoleum, the ruins of an enormous palace, Hugel continued along the road and presently stopped again. 
The columns varied in height, from almost nothing to over a hundred feet, and seemed about ten feet in girth. Once more, Kugel proceeded. As he drew near, he saw that the tops of the columns were occupied by men, reclining and basking in what remained of the sunlight. The rent and the clouds sealed shut, and the sunlight faded with finality. The men sat up and called back and forth, and at last descended the columns by ladders attached to the stone. Once on the ground, they trooped off toward a village half hidden under a grove of shrack trees. This village, about a mile from the columns, Kugel assumed to be Tusfold. At the back of the columns, a quarry cut into one of the steep-sided knolls Kugel had noted before. From this quarry emerged a white-haired old man, with stooping shoulders, sinewy arms, and the slow gait of one who precisely gauges each movement. He wore a white smock, loose gray trousers, and well-used boots of strong leather. From a braided leather cord around his neck hung an amulet of five facets. Spying Kugel, he halted and waited as Kugel approached. Kugel used his most cultivated voice. Sir, jump to no conclusions. I am neither vagabond nor a mendicant, but rather a seafarer who arrived on shore by way of the mud flats. That is not an ordinary route, said the old man. Practiced men of the sea most often use the docks at Port Perdus. Quite so. The village yonder is Tustvold. Properly speaking, Tustvold is that mound of ruins yonder, which I quarry for white stone. The local folk use the name for the village as well, and no great harm is done. What do you seek from Tustvold? Food and shelter for the night. However, I cannot pay a groat, since my belongings remain aboard the ship. The old man gave his head a disparaging shake. In Tustvold, you will get only what you pay for. They are a parsimonious lot and spend only for advancement. If you will be satisfied with a pallet and a bowl of soup for your supper, I can gratify your needs, and uh, you may dismiss all thought of payment. That is a generous offer, said Kugel. I accept with pleasure. Uh, may I introduce myself? I am Kugel. The old man bowed. I am Nisbet, the son of Nisvangel, who quarried here before me, and the grandson of Rounce, who was also a quarryman. But come, why stand here shivering when a warm fire awaits inside? The two walked toward Nisbet's abode, a huddle of ramshackle sheds leaning one on the other, built of planks and stone, the accretion of many years, perhaps centuries. Conditions within, while comfortable, were no less undisciplined. Each chamber was cluttered with curios and antiques collected by Nisbet and his predecessors while quarrying the ruins of old Tustfold and elsewhere. Nisbet poured a bath for Kugel and provided a musty old gown which Kugel might wear until his own clothes were clean. That is a task better left to the women of the village, said Nisbet. If you recall, I lack all funds, said Kugel. I accept your hospitality with pleasure, but I refuse to impose a financial burden upon you. No burden whatsoever, said Nisbet. The women are anxious to do me favors so that I will give them priorities in the work. In that case, I accept the favor with thanks. Hugel gratefully bathed and wrapped himself in the old gown, then sat down to a hearty meal of candlefish soup, bread, and pickled ramp, which Nisbet recommended as a specialty of the region. They ate from antique dishes of many sorts and used utensils no two alike, even to the material from which they were fabricated. Silver, glossolt, black iron, gold, a green alloy of copper, arsenic, and other substances. Nisbet identified these objects in an offhand manner. Each of the mounds you see rising from the plain represents an ancient city, now in ruins and covered over with the sift of time. Uh, 
when I am allowed an hour or two of leisure, I often go out to mine another of the mounds, and often I find objects of interest. That salva, for instance, was taken from the eleventh phase of the city Chilopsic, and is fashioned from the corfum inlaid with petrified fireflies. The characters are beyond my skill to read, but would seem to recite a children's song. This knife is even older. I found it in the crypts below the city I call Erod, though its real name is no longer known. Interesting, said Kugel. Do you ever find treasure, or perhaps valuable gems? Nisbet shrugged. Each of these articles is priceless, a unique memorial. But now, with the sun about to go dark, who would pay good Terses to buy them? More useful is a bottle of good wine. In this connection, I suggest that, like grandees of high degree, we repair to the parlor, where I will broach a bottle of well-aged wine, and we will warm our shins before the fire. A sound notion, declared Kugel. He followed Nisbet into a chamber furnished with an over-sufficiency of chairs, settees, tables, and cushions of many kinds, together with a hundred curios. Nisbet poured wine from a stoneware bottle of great age to judge from the iridescent oxides which encrusted the surface. Kugel tasted the wine with caution to find a liquor heavy and strong and redolent of strange fragrances. A noble vintage, pronounced Kugel. Your taste is sound, said Nisbet. I took it from the storeroom of a wine merchant on the fourth level of Say Campbell. Drink heartily, a thousand bottles still molder in the dark. My best regards. Hugel tilted his goblet. Your work lacks nothing for perquisites, this is clear. You have no sons to carry on your traditions? None. My spouse died long years ago by the sting of a blue fanticule, and I lacked all taste for someone new. With a grunt, Nisbet heaved himself to his feet and fed wood to the fire. He lurched back into his chair and gazed into the flames. Yet often I sit here of nights, thinking of how it will be when I am gone. Perhaps you should take an apprentice. Nisbet uttered a short, hollow laugh. It is not all so easy. Boys of the town think of tall columns even before they learn to spit properly. I would prefer the company of a man who knows something of the world. What, by the way, is your own trade? Hugel made a deprecatory gesture. I, uh, I am not yet settled upon a career. I have worked as Worminger, and recently I commanded a seagoing vessel. That is a post of high prestige. And true enough, but the malice of subordinates forced me to vacate the position. By way of the mud flats? Precisely so. Oh, such are the ways of the world, said Nisbet. Still, you have much of your life ahead, with many great deeds to do. Well, I look back on life with my deeds already done, and none of them greatly significant. Hugel said, When the sun goes out, all deeds, significant or not, will be forgotten together. Nisbet rose to his feet and broached another jug of wine. He refilled the goblets, then returned to his chair. Two hours of loose philosophizing will never tilt the scale against the worth of one sound belch. For the nonce, I am Nisbet the Quarryman, with far too many columns to raise and far too much work on order. Sometimes I wish that I too might climb a column and bask away the hours. The two sat in silence, looking into the flames. Nisbet finally said, I see that you are tired. No doubt you have had a tedious day. He pulled himself to his feet and pointed. You may sleep on yonder couch. 
Got a page break here, so we'll take a short break while I drink some water. <clears throat> In the morning, Nisbet and Kugel breakfasted upon griddle cakes with a conserve of fruits prepared by women of the village. Then Nisbet took Kugel out to the quarry. He pointed to his excavation, which had opened a great cleft in the side of the mountain. Old Tustvold was a city of thirteen phases, as you can see with your own eyes. The people of the fourth level built a temple to Miyamata, their ultimate god of gods. These ruins supply white stone to my needs. The sun is aloft. Soon the men from the village will be coming out to use their columns. Indeed, here they come now. The men arrived by the twos and threes. Hugo watched as they climbed their columns and composed themselves in the sunlight. In puzzlement, Kugel turned to Nisbet. Why do they sit so diligently on their columns? They absorb a healthful flux from the sunlight, said Nisbet. The higher the column, the more pure and rich is the flux, as well as the prestige of place. The women especially are consumed with ambition for the altitude of their husbands, when they bring in the Terces for a new segment, they want it at once and hector me unmercifully until I achieve the work. And if I must put off one of their rivals, so much the better. Odd that you have no competitors in what must be a profitable business. It is not so odd when you consider the work involved. The stone must be brought down from the temple. Sized, polished, cleaned of old inscriptions, given a new number, and lifted to the top of a column. This entails considerable work, which would be impossible without this. Nisbet touched the five-faceted amulet that he wore around his neck. A touch of this object negates the suction of gravity, and the heaviest object rises into the air. Amazing, said Kugel. The amulet is a valuable adjunct to your trade. Indispensable is the word. Ah, here comes Dame Kroos to chide me for my lack of diligence. A portly, middle-aged woman with the flat, round face and russet hair typical of the village folk approached. Nisbet greeted her with all courtesy, which she dismissed with a curt gesture. Nisbet, again I must protest! Since I paid my terses, you have raised first a segment to Tobersk and another to Silinx. Now my husband sits in their shadow, and their wives gloat together at my discomfiture. What is wrong with my money? Have you forgotten the gifts of bread and cheese I sent out by my daughter Turgola? What is your answer? Dame Kroos, give me only a moment to speak. Your twenty is ready for the raising, and I was so about to inform your husband. Ah! That is good news. You will understand my concern. Certainly, but to avoid future misunderstanding, I must inform you that both Dame Tobersk and Dame Silinx have placed orders for their twenty ones. Dame Krulz's jaw dropped. So soon, the Andal wipes. In that case, I too will have my twenty one, and you must start on it first. Nisbet gave a piteous groan and clawed at his white beard. Dame Kroos, be reasonable. I can work only to the limit of these old hands, and my legs no longer propel me at a nimble speed. I will do all possible. I can promise no more. Dame Kroos argued another five minutes, then started to march away in a huff, but Nisbet called her back. Dame Kroos, a small service you can do for me. My friend Kugel needs his garments expertly washed, cleaned, mended, and returned to prime condition. Can I impose this task upon you? Of course, you need only ask. Where are the garments? Kugel brought out the soiled clothes, and Dame Kroos returned to the village. That is the way it goes, Nisbet said with a sad smile. Strong new hands are needed to carry on the trade. What is your opinion in the matter? 
The trade has much in its favor, said Kugel. Let me ask this. Dame Kroos mentioned her daughter, Turgula. Is she appreciably more comely than Dame Kroos? And also, are daughters as anxious to oblige the quarrymen as their mothers? Nisbet replied in a ponderous voice, As to your first question, the folk of the village are Karamian stock, fugitives from the Rob Fog, and none are notable for splendid appearance. Turgula, for instance, is squat, underslung, and shows protruding teeth. As for your second question, perhaps I have misread the signs. Dame Petishko has often offered to massage my back, though I have never complained of pain. Dame Gex is at times strangely over-familiar. Hmm. Well, no matter. If, as I hope, you become associate quarrymen, you must make your own interpretations of these little cordialities, though I trust that you will not bring scandal to an enterprise which, to now, has been based upon probity. Hugo laughingly dismissed the possibility of scandal. I am favorably inclined to your offer. For a fact, I lack the means to travel onward. I will therefore undertake at least a temporary commitment at whatever wage you consider proper. Excellent, said Nisbet. We will arrange such details later. And now to work. We must raise the cross twenty. Nisbet led the way to the workshop on the quarry floor, where the twenty stood ready on a pallet, a dolomite cylinder five feet tall and ten feet in diameter. Nisbet tied several long ropes to the segment. After looking here and there, Kugel put on a perplexed question. I'm sorry, put a perplexed question. I see neither rollers, nor hoists, nor cranes. How do you, one man alone, move such great masses of stone? Have you forgotten my amulet? Observe, I touch the stone with the amulet, and the stone becomes charged with revulsion for its native stuff. If I kick it lightly, so, no more than a tap, the magic is fugitive and will last only long enough to bring the segment to its place. If I were to kick with force, the stone might stay repulsive to the land for a month, or even longer. Hugo examined the amulet with respect. How did you gain such a slight? Nisbet took Kugel outside and pointed to a bluff overlooking the plain. See where the trees hang past the cliff? At that place, a great magician named Mok the Mogifer built a manse and ruled the land with his mogging magic. He mogged to the east, and he mogged to the west, north, and south. Persons could lift their eyes to his face once, or with effort twice, but never three times. So strong was his maugery. Mac planted a square garden with magic trees at the four corners. The ossip tree survives to this day, and there is no better boot dressing than wax of the ossip berries. I dress my boots with ossip wax, and they are proof against the rocks of the quarry. So I was taught by my father, who learned from his father, and so back through time to a certain Nisvant, who first went to Mac's garden for ossip berries, there he discovered the amulet and its strength. Nisvont first established himself in the porterer's trade and moved goods great distances with ease. He became weary of the dust and dangers of travel and settled on this spot to become a quarryman, and I am the last of the line. The two men returned to the workshed. Under Nisbet's direction, Hugel took up the ropes and pulled at the twenty so that it slid slowly through the air and out toward the columns. Nisbet halted at the base of a column marked with a plaque reading, The Lofty Monument of Kroos! We exult only in the upper altitudes! Nisbet raised his head and called, Kroos, come down from your column! Your segment is ready to mount! Kroos's head, as he peered over the side of the column, was silhouetted against the sky. Satisfied that the calls were intended for himself, he descended to the ground. Your work has not been swift, 
he told Nisbet gruffly. Too long have I been forced to use an inferior flux. And Nisbet made light of the complaints. Now is now, and at the instant known as now, your segment is ready, and now you can enjoy the upper radiances. All very well with your nows, grumbled Cross. You ignore the deterioration of my health. I can only work to my best speed, said Nisbet. In this regard, allow me to introduce my new associate, Kugel. I fancy that work will now go with a fling, owing to Kugel's experience and energy. If such is the case, I will now place my order for five new segments. Dame Kroos will validate the order with a deposit. I cannot acknowledge your order at this moment, said Nisbet. However, I will keep your needs in mind. Kugel, are you ready? Then climb, if you will, to the top of Sippin's column and haul the segment gently on high. Cross and I will guide it from below. The segment was efficiently set in place, and Cross immediately climbed to the top and arranged himself to best advantage in the red sunlight. Nisbet and Kugel returned to the shed, and Kugel was instructed in the techniques of shaping, rounding, and smoothing the white stone. Kugel soon understood why Nisbet was delinquent in his deliveries. The first age had slowed his movements to a degree which his, uh, for which his efficiency could not compensate. Secondly, Nisbet was almost hourly interrupted by visitors, women of the village with orders, demands, complaints, gifts, and persuasions. We have another page break here, and it is incredibly humid, so I'm going to turn on my AC. Give me just two minutes or less. I'll be right back. All right, thanks for your patience. <laughs> On Kugel's third day of employment, a group of merchant traders stopped by Nisbet's abode. They were members of a dark-skinned race notable for amber eyes, aquiline features, and proudly erect posture. Their garments were no less distinctive. Pantaloons bound with sashes, shirts with wing collars, under jackets, and cutaway tabards in the colors of black, tan, fusk, and, am and umber. They wore wide-brimmed black hats with slouch crowns, which Kugel considered of excellent address. They had brought with them a great high-wheeled wagon loaded with objects concealed under a tarpaulin. As the elder of the group conferred with Nisbet, the others removed the cloth to reveal what appeared to be a large number of stacked corpses. Nisbet and the elder came to an agreement, and the four mounts, so Nisbet identified them to Kugel, began to unload the wagon. Nisbet took Kugel somewhat aside and pointed to a far mound. That is old Kehur, which once held sway from the falling wall to the Silkal streaks. During their high age, the folk of Kehur practiced a unique religion, which I suppose is no more preposterous than any other. They believed that a man or woman, upon dying, entered the afterlife using that bodily condition in which he or she had died, thereupon to pass eternity amid feasting, revelry, and other pleasures regarding which propriety forbids mention. Hence, it became the better part of wisdom to die in the full flower of life, since, for example, a rachitic old man, toothless, short-winded, and dyspeptic, could never fully enjoy the banquet songs and nymphs of paradise. The folk of Kehur, therefore, arranged to die at an early age, and they were embalmed with such skill that their corpses even today seem fresh with life. The mounts quarry the Kehur mausoleum for these corpses, and convey them across the wild waste to the Thuniac Conservatory at Noval, where, as I understand it, they are put to some sort of ceremonial use. While he spoke, the mount traders had unloaded the corpses, laid them in a row, and roped them together. The elder signaled Nisbet, who walked along the line of corpses, touching each with his amulet. 
He then walked back along the line and delivered to each corpse the activating kick. The Mount Elder paid Nisbet his fee. There was an interchange of gracious small talk, and then the Mounts set off to the northeast, the corpses drifting behind at an altitude of fifty feet. Such interludes, while entertaining and instructive, tended to delay the orders whose delivery was ever more urgently demanded both by the men who were invigorated by the upper air radiance and by the women who funded the raising of a column both in the interest of their husband's health and also to enhance the prestige of the family. To speed the work, Kugel initiated several labor-saving shortcuts, thereby arousing Nisbet's high approval. Hugo, you will go far in this business. These are clever innovations. I am pondering others even more novel, said Kugel. Clearly, we must keep abreast of demand, if only to maximize our own profits. No doubt, but how? I will give the matter my best attention. Excellent. The problem is as good as solved, so declared Nisbet who then went off to prepare a gala supper, which included three bottles of sumptuous green wine from the stores of the Shea Campbell wine cellar. Nisbet indulged himself to such an extent that he fell asleep on a couch in the parlor. Hugel seized the opportunity to conduct an experiment. From the chain around Nisbet's neck, he unclasped the five-sided amulet and rubbed it along the arms of a heavy chair. Then, as he had seen Nisbet do, he gave the chair an activating kick. The chair remained as heavy as before. Hugel stood back in perplexity. In some manner, he had misapplied the power of the amulet. Or might the magic be imminent in Nisbet and no other? Unlikely. An amulet was an amulet. Where, then, did Nisbet's act differ from his own? Nisbet, the better to warm his feet before the fire, had removed his boots. Hugel removed his own shoes, which were worn almost to shreds, and slipped his feet into Nisbet's boots. He rubbed the chair with the five-sided amulet and kicked it with Nisbet's boots. The chair instantly rebuffed gravity to float in the air. Most interesting, thought Hugel. He returned the amulet to Nisbet's neck and the boots to where he had found them. On the morrow, Hugel told Nisbet, I discover that I need boots of strong leather like yours, proof against the rocks of the quarry. Where can I obtain such boots? Such items are included among our perquisites, said Nisbet. Today I will send a messenger into the village and call for Dame Tartuk, the cobbler woman. Nisbet laid a finger alongside his crooked old nose and turned Kugel a mischievous leer. I have learned how to control the woman of Tustvald village, or for that matter, women in general. I never give them all they want. That is the secret of my success. In this present case, Dame Tartuk's husband sits on a column of only fourteen segments, making do with shadows and low-quality flux, while Dame Tartuk endures the condescension of her peers. For this reason, there is no harder-working woman in the village, save possibly Dame Kylis, who fells trees and shapes the natural wood into timber of specified size. In any event, you will be fitted for boots within the hour, and I dare say that you will be wearing them tomorrow. As Nisbet had predicted, Dame Taduk came out from the village on the run and asked of Nisbet his requirements. Meanwhile, Sir Nisbet, I trust you will give earnest attention to my order for three new segments. Poor Taduk has developed a cough and needs more intense radiation for his health. Dame Taduk, the boots are needed by my associate Kugel, whose present shoes are all shreds and holes, so that his toes scratch the ground. A pity! A pity! In regard to your segments, I believe that the first of the three is scheduled for delivery in perhaps a week, and the other soon after. That is good news indeed. And now, Sir Kugel, as to your boots. I have long admired those worn by Nisbet. Now please make me exact duplicates. Dame Taduk looked at him in bafflement. But Sir Nisbet's feet are two inches longer than yours, and somewhat more narrow and as flat as halibuts. Hugo paused to think. 
The dilemma was real. If the magic resided in Nisbet's boots, then only exact replicas would seem to serve the purpose. Nisbet dissolved the quandary. Oh, naturally, Dame Taduk cobbled the boots to fit. Why would Kugel place an order specifically for ill-fitting boots? For a moment I was perplexed, said Dame Taduk. And now I must run home to cut leather. I have a hide taken from the back of an old bull bock, and I will make you boots to last your life span or until the sun goes out, whichever is the sooner. In either case, you will lack all further need for boots. Well then, to work. On the following day, the boots were delivered, and in response to Kugel's specifications, they matched Nisbet's boots in every particular save size. Nisbet examined the boots with approval. Dame Taduk has applied a dressing, which is good enough for common folk, but as soon as it wears off and the leather acquires a thirst, we shall apply ossip wax, and your boots will then be as strong as my own. Hugo enthusiastically clapped his hands together. Uh, to celebrate the arrival of these boots, I suggest another gala evening. Why not? A fine pair of boots is something to celebrate. The two dined on broad beans and bacon, marsh hens stuffed with mushrooms, sour grass and olives, and a hunch of cheese. With these dishes, they consumed three bottles of that Shea Campbell wine known as Silver Hyssop. Such was the information supplied by Nisbet, who, as an antiquarian, had studied many of the ancient scripts. As they drank, they toasted not only Dame Taduk, but also that long-dead wine merchant whose bounty they now enjoyed, though indeed the wine seemed perhaps a trifle past its prime. As before, Nisbet became fuddled and lay down on the couch for a nap. Hugel unclasped the five-sided amulet and returned to his experiments. His new boots, despite their similarity to those of Nisbet, lacked all useful effect, save that for which they were intended, while Nisbet's boots, alone or in conjunction with the amulet, defeated gravity with ease. Most peculiar, thought Kugel, as he placed the amulet on Nisbet's chain. The only difference between the two pairs of boots was the dressing of ossip wax, from berries gathered in the garden of Mach the Magopher. To ransack the clutter of generations in search of a pot of boot dressing was not a task to be undertaken lightly. Hugel went off to his own couch. In the morning, Hugel told Nisbet, We have been working hard, and it is time for a little holiday. I suggest that we stroll over to yonder bluff and there survey the gardens of Mach the Margopher, we can also pick also berries for boot dressing, and who knows, we might come upon another amulet. A sound idea, said Nisbet. Today, I too lack zest for work. The two set off across the plain toward the bluff, a distance of a mile. Hugel towed a sack containing their needs, which Nisbet had touched with his amulet and kicked in order to negate the weight. By an easy route, they climbed the bluff and approached Mach's garden. Oh, nothing is left, said Nisbet sadly, save only the ossip tree, which seems to flourish despite neglect. That heap of rubble is all that remains of Mach's manse, which was built five-sided, like the amulet. Hugo approached the heap of stones and thought to notice a wisp of vapor rising through the cracks. He went close and, dropping to his knees, moved several of the stones. To his ears came the sound of a voice, and then another, engaged in what seemed an excited dialogue. So faint and elusive were the voices that words could not be distinguished, and Nisbet, when Kugel summoned him to the crevice, could hear no sounds whatever. Kugel drew back from the mound. To move the rocks might yield magical treasures, or, more likely, some unimaginable woe. Nisbet was of a like mind, and the two moved somewhat back from the ruined manse. Sitting on a slab of moldering stone, they ate a lunch of bread, cheese, spiced sausage, and onions washed down with pots of village-brewed beer. A few yards away, the ossip tree extended heavy branches from a gnarled silver-gray trunk five feet in diameter. Silver-green berries hung in clusters from the end of every twig, each berry a waxy sphere half an inch in diameter. 
After Kugel and Nisbet had finished their lunch, they plucked berries sufficient to fill four sacks, which Nisbet caused to float in the air. Trailing their harvest behind them, the two returned to the quarry. Nisbet brought out a great cauldron and set water to boiling, then added berries. Presently, a scum formed on the surface. There is the wax, said Nisbet, and skimmed it off into a basin. Four times the process was repeated until all the berries had been boiled and the basin was filled with wax. We have done a good day's work, announced Nisbet. I see no reason we should not dine accordingly. There are a pair of excellent fillets in the larder provided by Dame Pettish, who is butcher of the town. If you will kindly lay a fire, I will look through the closet for appropriate wine. Once again, Kugel and Nisbet sat down to a repast of heartening proportions, but as Nisbet worked to open a second flask of wine, the sound of slamming doors and the thud of heavy footsteps reached their ears. An instant later, a woman tall and portly, massive in arm and leg, with a bony jaw, a broken nose, and coarse red hair entered the room. Nisbet laboriously heaved himself to his feet. Dame Secours, I am surprised to see you here at this time of night. Dame Secours surveyed the table with disapproval. Why are you not out shaping my segments, which are long overdue? Nisbet spoke with cool hauteur. Today, Kugel and I attended to important business, and now, as is our habit, we dine. You may return in the morning. Dame Secours paid no heed. You take your morning meal far too late, and your evening meal far too early, and you drink over much wine. Meanwhile, my husband huddles well below the ha- I'm sorry, well below the husbands of Dame Pettish, Dame Haxel, Dame Cross, and others. Since kindliness has no effect, I have decided to try a new tactic, for which I use the term fear. In three words, if you do not gratify my needs in short order, I will bring my sisters here and perform a serious mischief. Nisbet employed the gentle voice of pure reason. If I acceded to your request, not a request, a threat, the other women of the town might also try to intimidate me to the detriment of orderly business. I care nothing for your problems. Provide my segments at once. Hugel rose to his feet. Dame Sikors, your conduct is singularly gross. Once and for all, Nisbet will not be coerced. He will provide you your segments in his own good time. He now demands that you leave the premises and on quiet feet. Nisbet now makes demands, does he? Striding forward, Dame Sikor seized Nisbet's beard. I did not come to listen to your braggadocio. She gave the beard a sharp tweak, then stepped back. I am going but only because I have delivered my message, which I hope you will take seriously. Dame Secours departed, leaving behind a heavy silence. At last, Nisbet spoke in falsely hardy tones. Oh, traumatic incursion, to be sure. I must have Dame Wixo look to the locks. Come, Kugel, return to your supper. The two continued with their meal, but the festive mood could not be recaptured. Hugel at last said, What we need is a stock or repository of segments ready for raising, so that we can gratify these prideful women on demand. No doubt, said Nisbet, but how is this to be done? Hugel tilted his head cautiously sidewise. Are you ready for unorthodox procedures. With a bravado conferred partly by wine and partly by Dame Secours's rude handling of his beard, Nisbet declared, I am a man to stop at nothing when circumstances cry out for deeds. In that case, let us get to work, said Kugel. The whole night lies before us. We shall demolish our problems once and for all. Bring lamps. Despite his brave words, Nisbet followed Kugel with hesitant steps. 
Exactly what do you have in mind? Hugo refused to discuss his plan until they reached the columns. Here, he signaled the laggard Nisbet to greater speed. A time is of the essence. Bring the lamp to this first column. That is the column of Fiddix. No matter. Put down the lamp, then touch the column with your amulet and kick it very gently, no more than a good brush. First, let me secure the column with this rope. Good. Now, apply the amulet and kick. Nisbet obeyed. The column momentarily became weightless, during which interval Kugel extricated the one segment and pushed it aside. After a few seconds, the magic dissipated, and the column returned to its former position. Observe, cried Kugel, a segment which we shall renumber and sell to Dame Sikors, and a fig for her nuisances. Nisbet uttered a protest. Fiddix will surely notice the deduction. Hugo smilingly shook his head. Improbable. I have watched the men climbing their columns, and they come out blinking and half asleep. They trouble to look at nothing but the state of the weather and the rungs of their ladders. Nisbet pulled dubiously at his beard. Tomorrow, when Fiddix climbs his column, he will find himself unaccountably lower by a segment. And that is why we must remove the one from every column. So now to work, there are many segments to move. With dawn lightening the sky, Kugel and Nisbet towed the last of the segments to a hiding place behind a pile of rocks on the floor of the quarry. Nisbet now affected a tremulous joy. For the first time, a sufficiency of segments is conveniently to hand. Our lives shall now flow more smoothly. Kugel, you have a fine and resourceful mind. Today we must work as usual. Then, in the unlikely event that the subtractions are noticed, uh, we shall merely disclaim all knowledge of the affair, or blame it on the mouse. Or we could claim that the weight of the columns had pushed the ones into the ground. True. Nisbet, we have done a good night's work. The sun moved into the sky, and the first contingent of men straggled out from the village. As Kugel had predicted, each climbed to the top of his column and arranged himself without any displays of doubt or perplexity, and Nisbet uttered a hollow laugh of relief. Over the next few weeks, Kugel and Nisbet satisfied a large number of orders, though never in such profusion as to arouse comment. Dame Sikors was allowed two segments rather than the three she had demanded, but she was not displeased. I knew I could get what I wanted. To gain the satisfaction of one's wishes, one needs only to propose unpleasant alternatives. I will order two more segments shortly when I can afford your exorbitant prices. In fact, you may begin work on them now so that I need not wait, eh, Nisbet? Do you remember how I pulled your beard? Nisbet responded with formal politeness. I will make a note of your order, and it will be fulfilled in its proper sequence. Dame Secours responded only with a coarse laugh and went her way. Nisbet gave a despondent sigh. I had hoped that a flow of segments would glut our customers, but if anything, we seem to have stimulated demand. Dame Pettish, for instance, is annoyed that Dame Gillinx's husband now sits on the same level as Pettish himself. Dame Viberal fancies herself the leader of society and insists that two segments separate Viberal from his social inferiors. Hugel shrugged. We can do only what is possible. In unexpectedly short order, the segments of the stockpile were distributed, and the women of the town once again became importunate. Hugel and Nisbet discussed the situation at length, and decided to meet excessive demands with absolute obduracy. Certain of the women, however, taking note of Dame Secours' success, began to make ever more categorical threats. Hugel and Nisbet at last accepted the inevitable, and one night went out to the columns and removed all the twos. As before, the men noticed nothing. 
Hugel and Nisbet attempted to fill the backlog of orders, and the antique urn in which Nisbet stored his tercies filled to overflowing. One day, a young woman came to confer with Nisbet. I am Dame Mupo. I have been wed only a week, but it is time to start a column for Mupo, who is somewhat delicate and in need of upper-level flux. I have inspected the area and selected a site, but as I walked among the columns I noted an odd circumstance. The bottom segments are numbered three rather than one, which would seem to be more usual. What is the reason for this? Nisbet started to stammer, and Kugel quickly entered the conversation. Uh, this is an innovation designed to help young families such as your own. Uh, for instance, Viburl enjoys pure and undiluted radiance on his 24. But starting you off with a 3 instead of a 1, you are only 21 blocks below him, rather than 23. Dame Mupo nodded her comprehension. Oh, that is helpful indeed. Hugo went on to say, we do not publicize the matter, since we cannot be all things to all people. Just regard this service as Nisbet's kindly assistance to you personally. And since poor Mupo is not in the best of health, we will provide you not only your three, but your four as well. But you must say nothing of this to anyone, not even Mupo, as we cannot extend these favors everywhere. I understand completely. No one shall know. On the next day, Dame Pettish appeared at the quarry. Nisbet, my niece has just married Mupo and brings me a peculiar and garbled story about threes and fours, which, frankly, I cannot understand. She claims that your man Kugel promised her a segment at no charge, as a service to young families. I am interested, because next week another niece is marrying, and if you are giving two segments for the price of one, it is only fair that you deal in the same manner with an old and valued customer such as myself. Hugo said smoothly, Ah, uh, my explanation confused Dame Mupo. Uh, recently, we have noticed vagrants and vagabonds among the columns. We warned them off, and then, to confuse would-be thieves, we altered our numerative system. In practice, nothing is changed. You need not concern yourself. Dame Pettish departed, dubiously shaking her head. She paused by the columns and looked them up and down for several minutes, then returned to the village. Nisbet said nervously, I hope no one else comes asking questions. Your answers are remarkable and confuse even me, but others may be more incisive. I imagine that we have heard the last of the matter, said Kugel, and the two returned to work. During the afternoon, Dame Secors came out from the village with several of her sisters. They paused several minutes by the columns, then continued to the quarry. Nisbet said in a quavering voice, Kugel, I appoint you spokesman for the concern. Be good enough to mollify these ladies. I will do my best, said Kugel. He went out to confront Dame Secors. Your segments are not yet ready. You may return in a week. Dame Secors seemed not to hear. She turned her pale blue eyes around the quarry. Where is Nisbet? Nisbet is indisposed. Our delivery time is once again, uh, I'm sorry, is once again a month or more since we must quarry more white stone. I am sorry, but we cannot oblige you any sooner. Dame Secors fixed her gaze full upon Kugel. Where are the ones and twos? Where are they gone so that the threes rest on the ground? Kugel feigned surprise. Is this really the case? Very odd. Still, nothing is permanent, and the ones or twos may have crumbled into dust. There is no evidence of such dust around the base of the columns. Hugo shrugged. Since the columns remain at their relative elevations, no great damage has been done. From the back of the quarry, one of Dame Secors's sisters came running. We have found a pile of segments hidden behind some rocks, and all are twos. Dame Secors gave Kugel a brief side glance, then turned and strode back to the village, followed by her sisters. Kugel went glumly into Nisbet's abode. 
Nisbet had been listening from behind the door. All things change, said Kugel. It is now time to leave. Nisbet jumped back in shock. Leave? My wonderful house? My antiques and famous bibelots? That is unthinkable. I fear that Dame Secours will not stop with simple criticism. Remember her dealings with your beard? I do indeed, and this time I will defend myself. Nisbet went to a cabinet and selected a sword. <laughs> I just, that was a weird way to say sword. Uh, here is the finest steel of old Karai. Here, Kugel, another blade of equal worth in a splendid harness. Wear it with pride. Kugel buckled the ancient sword about his waist. A defiance is all very well, but a whole skin is better. I suggest that we prepare for all eventualities. Never! cried Nisbet in a passion. I will stand in the doorway of my house, and the first to attack shall feel the edge of my sword. They will stand back and throw rocks, said Kugel. Nisbet paid no heed and went to the doorway. Kugel reflected a moment, then carried various goods to the wagon left by the mount traders. Food, wine, rugs, garments. In his pouch, he placed a pot of ossip boot dressing after first anointing his boots, and two handfuls of tersies from Nisbet's urn. A second pot of boot dressing he tossed upon the wagon. Kugel was interrupted in his work by an excited call from Nisbet. Kugel, they are coming at speed. They are like an army of raging beasts. Kugel went to the door and surveyed the oncoming women. You and your valiant sword may deter this horde from the front door, but they will merely enter from the back. I suggest withdrawal. The wagon is ready. Reluctantly, Nisbet went to the wagon. He looked over Kugel's preparations. Where are my tersies? You load a boot dressing, but no tersies. Is that sensible? Uh, the boot dressing, and not your amulet, defies gravity. The urn was too heavy to carry. Nisbet nevertheless ran inside and staggered out with his urn, spilling tersies behind him. The women were now close at hand. Observing the wagon, they emitted a great roar of wrath. Villains, halt! cried Dame Secours. Neither Kugel nor Nisbet heeded her command. Nisbet brought his urn to the wagon and loaded it with the other goods, but when he tried to climb to the seat, he fell, and Kugel had to lift him aboard. Kugel kicked the wagon and gave it a great push so that it floated away into the air, but when Kugel tried to jump upon the wagon, he lost his footing and fell to the ground. There was no time for a second attempt. The women were upon him. Holding sword and pouch so that they did not impede his running, Kugel took to his heels with the fastest of the women in pursuit. After half a mile, the women gave up the chase, and Kugel paused to catch his breath. Already, smoke was rising from Nisbet's abode as the mob wreaked vicarious vengeance on Nisbet. On top of their columns, the men stood up, the better to observe events. High in the sky, the wagon drifted eastward on the wind, with Nisbet peering over the side. Hugel heaved a sigh. Slinging the pouch over his shoulder, he set off to the south toward Port Perdue. All right, that is the end of the first segment of part three. Next is the second part called Fosselm. Oh man, I love Kugel so much. <laughs> he just always finds a way to ruin a good thing. Uh, anyway, if you listened in today, thanks for hanging out. I always appreciate it. Um, and feel free to take a look at my YouTube. It's the same username as my Twitch name. Oh, hi. Thank you for joining. I'm glad you're here today. <laughs> I'm glad you watch on YouTube. I appreciate it. Um, as always, if you got any feedback, feel free to leave me a comment or shoot me an email. Uh, you know, I did have someone suggest maybe start editing, and I'm thinking about it, so we'll see um, if I do it. <laughs> I probably won't do it to this one. I'm feeling deeply lazy today. Um, as always, thank you to Andalmadir for the use of his tunes. Uh, today we listened to The Lunar Lexicon on Spotify. Uh, you can find him on YouTube and Bandcamp. He's a really friendly guy, and he makes great music. Please give him a look. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's great for reading, any creative work, really. Um, and I will see you folks next time. We are nearing the end of the last, I'm sorry, of the uh, final shore, the farthest shore. 
And after that, we will read, um, oh Lord, I'm struggling today. Roadside Picnic by the Strugatsky twins, uh, the book that inspired Stalker, both the movie and the games. All right, folks, thanks for hanging. Uh, oh, Grubma, I'm glad you made it too. And I will see you folks again soon. Take it easy. <laughs>